Well, hello and welcome to our YouTube lecture. It's one of my first ones in a while. This is a little bit of an updated one from the one I did last year. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Cold War, the beginnings of the Cold War. Uh, in class, we're going to basically do period eight more thematically. And then when I feel like there's some very specific information we want to talk about, I'll, I'm going to utilize the YouTube lectures. Uh, you'll also notice that there will not be a video log for this one for those of you who are in my class. Those of you who are not, you know, you just watch this and enjoy it, and, eh, you know. Um, no, instead we'll occasionally do little quizzes on the uh, YouTube lectures and say, ooh, I know, <laughs> lots of fun. All right, so let's think about the Cold War, and we're going to look at it through the presidencies of Truman and Eisenhower. And so we'll get started, but let's think of a little bit of a refresher here in the beginning of what is the United States foreign policy. As we've mentioned multiple times in class, we know with George Washington's farewell address, the idea of staying out of entangling alliances, the idea of isolationism and neutrality is what would basically steer the United States foreign policy throughout much of the 19th century. Then going into the beginning of the 20th century, things begin to change a little. Theodore Roosevelt, for instance, uh, started to see things a little differently. He wanted to have the United States of more uh, involvement in the world as a police officer, as it were. He has his Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, which, uh, yes, Europe stays out of Latin America, but Roosevelt could go anytime in there he want to settle matters, uh, part of his big stick policy, as he also became, uh, became known as. Roosevelt became the first president to win a Nobel Peace Prize in negotiating uh, the end of the Japanese Russo War. So America is taking more of an involvement in world affairs. Then we get to World War I and Woodrow Wilson, who may have ran for re-election on the promise that he kept you out of war, but remember there was no guarantee you were staying out of war. And as a progressive liberal, uh, he saw this as an opportunity to make the world safe for democracy, right? His new world order, the idea of monarchies have had their day and more of democratic progressive ideals should be established. He established his 14 points for how he would bring about this new world order. Of course, in the end, Europe rejected most of this, except for the League of Nations, which the United States never actually joins. When more conservative Republicans uh, get in control in the 1920s and 30s, America went back into isolationism. But World War II and the bombing of Japan would change that forever, and the United States would emerge as a world leader, if not the world leader. FDR began to envision what he called an open world idea of economic and trade, where the whole world would come together in that sort of respect. Um, and this is what eventually would lay down the process of what become known as the Cold War, is the two big countries at the end, the United States and the USSR, the Soviet Union, would not actually see eye to eye over this idea of an open world, which brings us into period eight. We see this post-war tension now. You know, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies. They both fought against Hitler. Um, the Soviets wanted to see an end of the fascist dictator states uh, for their own personal reasons, as well as the United States. But eventually, uh, with the closing years of the war, 1944, 1945, gradually became obvious that perhaps these two countries were going to have a little difficulty in getting along. So the United States would eventually develop their new foreign strategy based on this idea of tension now that has come around. And you see in our concepts here, there's three things that they're going to look at when creating a new foreign policy. They want collective security now. Uh, they're going to join the United Nations. Uh, they're going to join things like NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organizations. Right? They want the world to start to come together. Uh, international aid, uh, the Marshall Plan, uh, the World Bank. Uh, these things are going to become very important to the United States in rebuilding Europe uh, and rebuilding Asia after the war and various economic institutions. As we mentioned in class, the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, this is what is going to solidify the idea of world capitalism with Keynesian economics. Uh, 
as its basis. And these are the things that are going to really upset the Soviet Union. And eventually these things will cause more tension between the two superpowers. A containment policy. Uh, we're, like I said, we're going to look at this in class more thematically. So this idea of containment. Uh, multiple presidents, starting with Truman, going through Eisenhower, then Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and culminating with Ronald Reagan. Uh, Democratic and Republican presidents will constantly have this issue of the Cold War bef before them. And starting with the Truman presidency, the idea of containment. How do you contain co communism? Looking at it like a disease. Uh, if it gets into one country, the surrounding countries around there are, you know, open up to infection, as it were. And the United States is going to create a policy of containment. They don't want open conflict with the Soviets. Uh, each side now has the bomb, uh, atomic bombs, and then eventually they get to the more hydrogen or nuclear-powered bombs. And that is, that's not good. We don't want to have actual fighting wars. It's going to be based, this idea of containment, from a diplomat who is stationed in Moscow in 1944 and began to understand the Soviets, uh, George Keenan. We'll, we're going to look at him in class, but the long telegram that uh, the Truman administration, actually the Treasury Department, had contacted uh, Keenan and wanted to know why the Soviets would not be part of the World Bank, for instance. And he sends back this 8,000 word telegram is why it's called the long telegram. And yes, we're actually going to look at this in class, but I won't make you read the whole thing. Just some very interesting points of it. And it's from there, eventually, this idea of containment policy will come into play. Interestingly, Keenan will not use that word in his long telegram. Later on, he'll write an article, at least known as Article X, because he can't put his name to it, where he'll start talking more and more about this idea of containing communism instead of going to war, which changes the role of the president then. Uh, the president, over the next several decades, is going to have to decide how are they going to stand up to communism. And it's not just the Soviet Union. It's going to be other countries. There's going to be moments of actual military engagement in Korea. There's going to be a war in Korea, although it's going to be through the United Nations and more classified as a police action than an actual war. And in the, the gradual buildup in Vietnam, which will become one of the great nightmares for America, and will topple a president in Lyndon Johnson. We see here in Concept 811C, uh, there will be periods of relative peace as well. Uh, there's direct and indirect military uh, uh, confrontations, proxy wars, where you're going to use other nations and pit other nations against each other, or sometimes... For instance, like in Korea, the United States will go in there, but not fight the Russians, but they'll fight allies of the Russians. The Russians will go into Afghanistan in the 1970s, and though the United States will not send troops in there, they will help build up the resistance against the Russians, so these proxy wars. But there are times of mutual coexist coexistence, excuse me, am I getting tongue-tied here? Uh, detente is something we'll talk about that becomes especially important to the presidency of Richard Nixon. This idea of easing or cooling off the, the Cold War tensions. A series of treaties or talks. SALT is strategic arms limitation talks. And there will be two of them. The idea of trying to get along in a very technically advanced world. This mutually assured destruction or MAD uh, is what's going to permeate much of the discussion at the time period. But the Cold War is a real situation in this time period. Those individuals of my age, uh, you know, we're getting old. I'm sorry you teenagers out there listening to this, but we grew up in a world where you just never knew. One wrong move, one wrong word said at the wrong time, or, or maybe a confusion about what is happening could launch missiles. And at that moment, well, it's all over. <laughs> So it was very important that presidents begin to understand this. The role of the president became vital in running the various elections of the time. Americans would, in the background of their mind, often think about, well, how will this president stand up to the Soviet? How will this president stand up to communism in the world?
Will it get to the point where maybe this is the guy who might push buttons? So we'll maybe vote for the other guy. We'll talk about the election of 1964, for instance, when Lyndon Johnson runs against Barry Goldwater. That was a very powerful election. And I'm going to show you in class one of the most interesting uh, television campaign ads ever. It was only shown once because it scared people. The idea if you voted for Barry Goldwater, it could lead to uh, nuclear annihilation. So these became very, very powerful motivating tools for the presidency, for why people voted in this time period. Let's look at some very specific moments, though. Uh, starting again with Truman. This is where we originally get the idea of containment. Remember, he inherits the presidency from FDR, who had passed away, and he was a uh, the vice president, now president of the United States. It's under his administration that Keenan wrote the long telegram because they wanted to know how do we get along with our allies, the Soviets. And eventually, one of the first things Truman will do is his Truman Doctrine. Turkey and Greece, this was predominantly aimed at. They were communist, um, let's say, agitators, perhaps trying to overthrow those governments, and they were seeking help. So Truman decided to take a hard line. You know, it must be the policy of the United States to support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Now, armed minorities, obviously within Greece and within Turkey, you have these revolutionary groups, but they're minorities trying to resist their governments and even overthrow them. Outside pressure is a veiled reference, obviously, to the Soviet Union. And what winds up happening is Congress agrees and millions and millions of dollars in aid is going to be set aside to help the governments of Greece and Turkey. And this becomes very important, the Truman Doctrine, because it eventually sets up what will become known as the Marshall Plan. After World War II, Europe is in disarray. It's been destroyed by the Soviet, I'm uh, sorry, by the Nazi war machines. The Soviet Union is trying to influence these fallen countries, and start small minority revolutions. Well, how do you stop that? Well, the United States is going to set aside $12 billion, with a B, dollars to rebuild Europe. They want to rebuild France. They want to rebuild what will become West Germany. Uh, Italy needs to be rebuilt. Greece needs to be rebuilt. England needs to be rebuilt. Uh, they are going to do everything they can to flood in American dollars and help those countries revitalize themselves so that the idea of communism doesn't become attractive to those people who have lost everything due to war. Now, at the time, this was actually very controversial. There are a lot of people wondering, why are we spending our taxpayer dollars to rebuild Europe? But as, a, as historians and politicians look back, they begin to realize, wow, it's better to spend $12 billion dollars then who knows how many billions fighting a war that could have ended in nuclear annihilation. This is one of the reasons why Truman over the years, his, his popularity has gone up and he, his ranking has gone up. Although it should be noted that when he left the White House, Truman famously said, I couldn't be elected dog catcher. He left the White House in some of the lowest presidential approval ratings ever. But as I'll point out, not only here in the Cold War, but uh, a, a big theme of the Cold War will be civil rights, and we're going to talk about that a lot as well in class. How do you fight communism when you're talking about the, it's a totalitarian regime that oppresses its people when there's oppression in the United States with African Americans? And so civil rights is going to really benefit because of the Cold War, and Truman will be one of the first presidents to actually try to act to help with civil rights. But that'll be uh, another lesson in another day. Containment succeeds. At first, Germany is divided. You get a West and an East Germany. And this is something we're going to have to talk about in class. It's not easy. Uh, it's sometimes very confusing to students. Uh, you divide. West Germany becomes democratic. East Germany is communistic. But there is a city in East Germany called Berlin, which is the capital of Germany. So the Allies in the Soviet Union agree to divide Berlin. There's an East and a West Berlin. So you have a city that is in the heart of communist 
East Germany, controlled by the Soviet Union, and the city here of Berlin will be divided. East Berlin will be communist capital. West Berlin is a democracy. After a while, Stalin can't have this. And he's eventually going to try and cut off all its electricity, all of its water, all of its supplies, and surround uh, West Berlin and threaten to choke out its millions of people that live there if the United States and the Western powers of Great Britain and France do not leave and allow all of Berlin to become part of East Germany and, and communistic. Well, here's where Truman decides to stand up. The Berlin airlift is going to take place. For more than a year, thousands of flights are going to come out of West Germany and fly over West Berlin and drop supplies. Food, medicine, clothing. And in this plane specifically became known as the candy plane. That's why there's Germans here. Uh, young, I'm sorry, Germans. Of course they're Germans. I mean, young children here. Uh, this was the candy plane dropping, you know, sweets for the children. And Truman is going to basically call Stalin's bluff. We're sending our Air Force over every single day. Thousands of flights will happen. And we will drop food and medicine and, and candy and everything else we can. I dare you to shoot a plane down. I dare you to start World War III. After a while, Stalin will back down and Truman will win. Containment here is a success. Uh, I would also like to recommend that you go to our textbook and read a little bit more specifically about the Berlin Airlift because, again, quizzes are coming. Unfortunately, containment can fail. Um, this will become one of the things that will come to haunt the Democratic Party because Truman being a Democrat, uh, China was an, an ally of the United States, but before World War II, it was already going through its own communist revolution. Mao Zedong on one side, he's the communist leader. And Chiang Kai-shek, who is a nationalist, not a, not, not a Democrat in any sense of the word, but the United States will back the nationalists in Chiang Kai-shek, but then World War II happens and both sides will fight the Japanese. As soon as World War II is over, they go right back in their revolution. Uh, the United States felt that Chiang Kai-shek would win, and then he did not. And Mao Zedong won. And the communists took over China, and China became red. And this becomes a mantra of the Republican Party throughout the 60s and 70s, that China fell under democratic watch. That the Democrats all of a sudden become soft on communism. And this will hurt you know, Democrats when they try to run for office. Um, but it's really not true, but that's just how it was perceived. So it, it seems as a failure of the Truman administration. The Korean War breaks out while Truman is in his second term. Uh, North Korea had been divided. North Korea was communistic. South Korea was uh, democratic. The 38th parallel line is what separated them. And in 1950, the North Koreans surprised attacked South Korea. The United Nations is involved in this. The United States used the United Nations to fight this war. Thus, you know, presidents find loopholes in all kinds of things. I can't, I don't want to get Congress to declare war on North, North Korea because that could escalate with China. So let's use the United Nations instead. And the United Nations agreed and more than 80% of the troops will be American. But there are other European troops here as well. Douglas MacArthur becomes the general, the, the, the command uh, for all these armed forces. Uh, at, in the beginning, there's some great success. He'll do a surprise attack of his own. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details of the Korean War, but I do want to point this out. We've talked about Douglas MacArthur a couple of times. This is when he finally gets fired by a president. Uh, Truman, remember, he could have been fired by Hoover with the bonus army situation, um, there's some questionable things of what he does in the Philippines, but he winds up winning uh, the Atlantic, I'm sorry, the Pacific campaign against Japan in World War II. But here in Korea, he's ordered only to push the North Koreans back over the 38th parallel line. That is his orders from the United Nations and the United States. And MacArthur being MacArthur looks at orders as suggestions, and he attacks North Korea.
And the North Koreans begin to flee. Their armies begin to flee north into China. That caused China to attack. And when China attacked MacArthur, the American army is in complete retreat, trying to get out of North Korea as fast as it can before the, the Chinese armies overwhelm them. MacArthur begins to ask for the access codes for atomic bombs. He wants to bomb tr uh, tr strategic, here we go again, one of those words, strategic locations in North Korea and China. And of course, <laughs> Truman is like, no. And at one point in a newspaper, he basically calls the President of the United States a coward. And Truman can't take that anymore. And MacArthur is fired. But MacArthur is one of those generals who is allowed to come to the United States and have a ticker tape parade. He's allowed to address Congress. And he makes this very interesting, famous comment where he says, old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And as you've come to find out, until you were here in the American history class, many of you never even heard of Douglas MacArthur because he faded away. All right, well, let's move on now. Um, the United States, uh, our concepts talk about global leadership. And this is now, again, we are so far away from Washington's idea of isolationism. There's a lot going on in the world. You know, Truman is playing chess, as it were, with Stalin over many things using his containment policy. There's decolonialization uh, is taking place in Africa and Asia. And now it's, do these Asian and African countries go democratic? Do they go communist? And both countries, the Soviet Union and the United States, will be highly involved in this, trying to get various countries to come onto their side. We talked about NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. There's also a SATO, a Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Russia will counter with the Warsaw Pact, countries that ally, ally itself behind the Soviet Union. So you have all these countries now in the world are taking sides against each other. <clears throat> and in this atmosphere, the election of 1952 takes place. And Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican, wins. And Americans look towards him. In a lot of respects, you can almost say that he was drafted to be president. He, he, there's always this claim that he didn't want to run for presidentship. He wasn't sure if he'd run as a Democrat or as a Republican, but eventually he switches and comes to the Republican side. And the Americans want him. He's the winner of World War II. He's the architect of D-Day. And who better than to understand the difficulties of a world that is going crazy than a man of war who can actually help bring about peace? And it's quite interesting. If we had time to thoroughly study Eisenhower's eight years, it could be argued, though not all agree, that Eisenhower really helped a lot and try to limit tensions, but he also has his own failures as well. Um, his Secretary of State is a, is a guy named John Foster Dulles, and uh, I always find it funny in one of our books it brings out that the slogan was Dull, dull Dullest, and Dulles. Not, not the most energetic person, but as Secretary of State, Foster Dulles helps to create their own idea of containment. Uh, brinkmanship and domino theory. They're going to scale down the actual military, you know, not have as many men in the, you know, the foot soldiers out there, but build up a massive air force. Strategic Air Command, SAC, right? Strategic Air Command. This massive uh, air force with super bombers. Uh, these planes that can fly at high altitude with atomic and nuclear bombs on them that can go anywhere in the world in a, in a moment's notice. So bringing us always at the brink of war, right? The threat of war is what brinkmanship is. The Soviets won't do anything because they know that the United States will respond with force. And again, this kind of goes back to Keenan's idea of, you know, the Soviet knows no logic of reason, Right is what he says, and we'll, just, we'll, we'll discuss that in class. And domino theory, the fear that if one nation falls to the communists, then it's like dominoes, then all the nations around it will begin to fall. So using brinkmanship in order to stop the falling of the dominoes and use it through a massive air force. We go into a space race. The Soviets launched the first satellite, Sputnik. Uh, scared a lot of Americans. All of a sudden there's this satellite flying over the United States. 
First time ever a satellite is up there. So the United States realizes that they're perhaps way behind in the space race, so they'll do a lot. We will get NASA at this time period. The National Defense Act is passed, promoting science and math in high schools. Uh, a lot of you are in these various programs today, you know, the STEM programs. It's kind of a reflection of what that was in the Cold War era. Uh, the Interstate Highway Act, we're going to talk a lot about this in class as well. Eisenhower, who had seen the Autobahns of Germany and the massive highways, realized the United States, as massive as it was, did not have interstate highways. Part of this is for defense purposes. This, these massive roads like I-95 and I-10 uh, and I-75, they're, they're designed to help transport troops. They're also designed in some areas, what if you have to land planes and helicopters? So a lot of this was motivated by military, but it also is going to help connect the United States in, in a wonderful way, and it's going to help invigorate our American economy. So we're going to talk about the Interstate Highway Act later on as more of a social thing, but you should know it had its military purposes as well. Some of the failures. Again, there's John Foster Dulles um, and his brinkmanship. There he is there with Eisenhower. We love Ike was always what people loved about this time period. It's like having Grandpa in the White House. Well, here's why brinkmanship doesn't work. You have the Hungarian Re Revolution takes place in 1956. The people of Hungary, they want to overthrow their communist you know, dictator government. And they believe the United States will come to its aid. It's not going to. Coming to its aid, Soviets roll in tanks into Hungary. If the United States actually begins to bomb them, that's World War III. The Warsaw Pact is there. There's other nations that will they'll get involved. NATO will get involved. And everything will fall apart. So the Soviets called Eisenhower's bluff in this. And it turns out there's really no way you can actually start bombing people. There's the Suez Crisis that takes place uh, in Egypt. The Suez Canal is, is the version of the Panama Canal over here. It helps connect the Mediterranean with the Indian Ocean. It was owned by British and French companies. Uh, uh, Nasir, who is the president of Egypt, wants to build dams along the Nile River. And the United States and Great Britain aren't sure if they'll help them do that or not. So Nasir gets angry. He starts to reach out to the Soviets, who are more than willing to help him. And then Nasir, just to prove a point, nationalizes the Suez Canal. Like I said, the Suez Canal was built by British and French, and so they controlled and basically owned the canal. Well, he took it away from them and said, nope, it's now part of Egypt and the Egyptian government. And um, the United States took a position of the, trying to defend Egypt and its sovereignty. And Great Britain and France, without speaking to the United States, without letting Eisenhower know, decided to invade Egypt. And they brought in a third player. They brought in Israel. And Israel becomes part of this attack against Egypt. This will anger Eisenhower very much. Eisenhower will cut off oil reserves to Britain and France, telling them, you can, unless you get out of Egypt, you're not going to get your oil. This will embarrass the governments of France and, and Great Britain. And eventually, Eisenhower will institute his own doctrine, the Eisenhower Doctrine, which promises support of the Middle East. He doesn't want the Middle East to turn to the Soviets. He's too afraid that this situation that Brant, uh, Brant's, well, yeah, let's call them Brant's, Britain and France create. Uh, it brought out too much tension here in the Middle East. Uh, and some of these countries might turn the way of the communism, of communism like Iran and Iraq. So he is, institutes his Eisenhower doctrine, this idea of helping the Middle East. The French Indochina War takes place too during his presidency. France wants to reclaim its colony in Vietnam, and Vietnam wants to go independent. So this massive war takes place, and France loses. We're going to talk about this in class too. This is what's going to lead the United States' involvement in Vietnam. They will first send financial aid to the French. Then eventually, as France loses in 1954 at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, which we'll talk about later, now the United States will inherit the problem of Vietnam. And I think, without even talking about it, spoiler alert, I think we all know how Vietnam's going to end up in the United States. 
America's longest war uh, to date is the Vietnam War. Again, all in the shadow of this Cold War situation. So here are just some of the points I want you to know about Eisenhower and Truman. But before we go, here are the terms specifically. Cold War, make sure you know what that means. Again, we have a textbook. Please look at the textbook under Cold War. Uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement, we have notes on that from class. But again, we can always look this up and read it. The Truman Doctrine, remember what this was, what two countries this was aiding. What was the Marshall Plan? Why was it implemented for Europe? The Berlin Airlift. Why is this a success for Truman? And the Warsaw Pact. Let's think about what brinkmanship was. Why did uh, John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower decide on this policy of brinkmanship? How did it tie into their theory of domino theory? What is the Interstate Highway Act? Why is that so important during this time period? And the Suez Crisis. Uh, make sure again to look and see what that is. Well, I think that's the last one. I'm afraid to push the button to see if it ends. If it if there's another one, I'll apologize, but I think that's the last one. And I'd like to say goodbye at this time. But no, the French Indochina War was there. Ha, ah, I fooled myself. All righty. Make sure you know those terms. Because like I said there will be quizzes will be coming. And have a good day.